kind of theme by Haydn. Same theme, and yet expressing a lot of different moods, a lot of different emotions, everything from triumph to grief and sadness to terror, all on the same theme, very much as you'll be hearing from Professor Nelson, like the uh, Oris Dyer. Slide from a bowl at the MFA that you will be looking at, or have looked at, the killing of Agamemnon. I remind you that the uh, MFA tours continue over the weekend and through next Wednesday. If you haven't signed up, if you haven't picked up the worksheet, just stop by the core office, room 119, and uh, we'll get that for you and get you signed up. Now, listen. Save next Thursday evening at 8 o'clock. Save a week from tonight. Why should you do that? Because that is the evening that the uh, students uh, in this class will be performing scenes from the art style. This is something not to be missed. It's a great occasion every year. It's a way, first of all, to get this play off the page. You, I guarantee you will discover things, feel things, understand things that you can't just by reading it. Second, it's just a nice occasion, occasion to meet with your fellow students, with faculty. We'll have refreshments afterwards. That's next Thursday, 8 o'clock. Am I sure where that is? No, not yet. That's why I'm not saying where. But save the time, 8 o'clock next Thursday, for the student door style performance. Not to be missed. Honor students, you know we meet tomorrow. We meet at 3 o'clock in CAS 201. If you still don't have the book, the book is available at the bookstore. And uh, we'll be ready to go on that tomorrow. Professor Spate has introduced us to the civic context of Greek tragedy, the amazing circumstances under which it was performed, the ideas of character and fate, destiny, that are part of tragedy. Professor Esposito last time dwelt on the particular themes, the dramatic tensions in the first play of the trilogy, the Agamemnon. Now to take us through the libation bearers and the amenities and to look at the whole effect of this amazing trilogy. Our lecturer this morning is Professor Stephanie Nelson. Her lecture is entitled Freedom and Necessity, Variations on a Theme from Aeschylus Oristia. Professor Stephanie Nelson. also your fate. Yeah, I thought I'd begin with you, Sandra. Now, a lot of you, I know, have read Greek tragedy before. And if you've read Greek tragedy, um, you know perfectly well that usually murders aren't committed on stage. <coughs> and if you look at the stage now, you know perfectly well why. Is that in focus? Can you see that? No. Can you focus a little more? I, it's like talking to God, I don't know if it's okay. <laughs> Maybe they will, sometimes God answers. You can look, you can see the little people here, right? This is why I don't like this. You can see that the visual impact of a murder, right, is obviously not going to make that kind of big bang. It's not like um, Shakespeare's stage, where King Lear glossed it, I think, blinded it directly in front of you, like I'm in front of you. You can't get that effect here, visually. So what do you have to use are words. I don't know how many of you have been to Greece or been to this theater, but it's really incredible. It's truly amazing. I don't know how they did it. It's almost literally true that you can hear a dime drop. You wouldn't believe that you're that far away, and every word is as distinct as my language right now. The words, they're going to do it. So now that makes sense, because most that makes sense of why most Greek tragedy works with the messenger speech. Right? You remember um, in the Antigone, for example, those of you who have read it, okay, that when Hymen commits suicide, the messenger comes and explains what happened. Or if you've read Oedipus Rex, right, what happens is after Jocasta hangs herself, a messenger comes and describes incredibly vividly to put you into the scene. <coughs> what happens is that this is the 
with incredible technique. And what happens in the Agamemnon, something very different in this sense, is he has this character, Cassandra, who has a curse. Okay? And her curse, is she can see the pattern. She knows what's happening. But she can't do anything about it if she can't get anybody to believe her. And so think of the kind of tension of this. Actually, what happened is the murder is described in this play before it happens. And the chorus just cannot understand. Now, if you like, why is that important for this play? I think for just a minute about Agamemnon. Now, there's no, this, this is again the paradox of all, the, all of the women talking about. There seems to be no question in the play that the choice that Agamemnon made was not fated. He had to choose between killing his daughter or betraying his troops, and the choice was his. Now, when he looked at that choice, he saw either way something horrible was going to happen. He felt the stillness of the winds around him. There's a movie of this that's incredible it's called Iphigenia and Alice. And if you can see it, you should. You get the sense of stillness and thousands and thousands of soldiers all looking at him, like, all waiting to see what he's going to do. And he's thinking of Helen, who's over in Troy, and he's thinking of the Trojans, and he's thinking of his daughter. And he makes, and we've all discussed this, of course, he makes what seems to him the right choice, the choice of duty, the sacrifice. He sacrifices his personal desires, his personal inclinations, okay, for the sake of his position as king. Notice what he doesn't notice. In that family, every generation there's murder. Every generation, the parents destroy the children. It's a self-consuming household. When Agamemnon made that choice, when he fell into the pattern of the house of Atreus, he never noticed. The same way that Professor Esposito was speaking of when he walked across that rug, he didn't notice. <coughs> That's why I particularly wanted you to see this vase. When Orestes comes out after the murder of Aegisthus and his mother Clytemnestra, he'll bring this net. And this you just have to see. Those of you who saw it at the MFA yesterday were unlucky because it's just incredible. When you see it, just look at that net. Look at how Agamemnon is struggling against that net. And the more he struggles, the more entangled he gets. Okay. Now, Professor Spade was talking about Hamlet, the lines I was thinking about in Hamlet are Claudius's. When he talks about, O oh, limed soul, O oh, soul engaged in bird line, engaged in the net. The more it struggles, the more it is engaged. The mind and soul that's struggling to be free are more engaged. The more you struggle against the fate, the more freely you choose to get out of the curse, the pattern of this house, the more you fall into it. So that's why I wanted to start this way, before I even talked about why I chose this part and why I chose the music. The idea is that there's a pattern. But the critical point is, you will never know the pattern until after it's happened. Now, if you look at the pot, again, you have to see the pot at the MFA and just walk around it. Because what you see is what the effect I think I was trying to get by flipping back and forth. It just repeats. You imagine yourself just walking around this pot. Generation after generation after generation is a murder. And I'm sure you've all talked about the section, the way Orestes' murder parallels the murder right, of Clytemnestra, Clytemnestra's murder of her husband. In both cases, there's a choice between the family and the city. In both cases, there's a man and a woman. Every time, the cycle goes on. But the music I chose is slightly different. And the reason why I want to choose the music is because it comes to a resolution. It's the same basic idea. What Brahms did was he just chose a theme. Right? In this play, the theme is revenge, the theme is murder, 
theme is a family consuming itself. But Brahms is something slightly different. He brings the music to a resolution. Do you remember a long, long time ago, I think this is the first time it came up, Professor Wiesel was talking about the book of Job, and complaining about modern novels. And what he said is, what you need is a beginning, and a middle, and an end. This is a trilogy. It's very carefully structured in exactly that way. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's a past for Restes, there's a present, his own act, but most importantly in this play, I think there's an end. The first thing I want to talk about is just the idea of that trilogy. What's going on with this idea of one play that's also three plays? And it's worthwhile realizing that actually it's unusual, as far as we know. All Greek tragedies were presented in groups of three. But the idea of actually making the three separate plays, and they are three separate plays, three separate generations, also be one play. It's familiar to us because we think of a play in three acts. In a way, this is a play in three acts. But it was a unique idea to the Greeks. But the idea of trilogy itself wasn't unique. And I mean in this way, I don't know if you've noticed, okay, as um, you go through the play, how often threes are mentioned. There are obviously numbers are very significant, um, and in different cultures, different numbers get very, become very significant. So the Greeks, they actually had um, one convention that's very much the same as ours, and ours is three strikes and you're out. The Greeks had three falls in wrestling, three falls in wrestling, and that was over. And when the Greeks poured a libation, when you poured a dedication to the gods, the third one was to Zeus. It was to Zeus under a particular aspect. Remember there's Zeus Xenios, Zeus that protects the ties of guest friends. There's also Zeus Telios, a Zeus that ends things, Zeus that brings things to a telos, to a completion. And you, you've seen this pattern before. This is the pattern that Aeschylus is taking over. You've already seen it in the first chorus. This is a passage that Professor Spate quoted, but I'm going to quote it again because it's critical. It's the story of the history of the gods. And for some reason, and it's a reason I'm going to talk about, Aeschylus wants that in your mind as you go into the story of Orestes and the House of Atreus. He who was so mighty once, storming for the wars of heaven, he has had his day. Ornos, the first primeval king of heaven, is gone. And then his son, who came to power, met his match. Cronos, too, was suppressed. In the third fall, the third fall in wrestling is the final one, and he is gone. Zeus, Zeus, Raise your cries and sing him, Zeus the victor, you will reach the truth. So appropriately, I think, for the third time, I'm going to tell you the story. The story is the sequence of the generations of the heavens. There are a number of reasons why I want to tell you this. The first is where it ends, with Athena, which is also where our trilogy will end. The second is the same theme as we see in the Oresteia, the theme of the older generation trying to keep down the younger one, destroying their own children. And you remember that picture, maybe you remember all the way back to last Thursday, a whole week ago. But the picture, the slide we had up just as a break from the Greek art for Professor Spate's lecture was the one, Kronos eating his son. So you think back, see if you remember that slide. He literally, his head, he has this enormous figure with his head off, and just a bloody stump of a neck as he devours his own child. That's the pity and fear of tragedy. <coughs> the other reason why I want to tell you this story is part of the contrast of the old gods, the dark gods, the primeval gods, and the new, the light of the again, that Professor Spate was talking about. But now I want to tell you the story and listen for a pattern of three. So what's the story? Story is simple. The first father realizes that his son will replace him and won't let him grow up. 
He represses the children in the mother. In a way, it's like what Penelope does to Telemachus. If Telemachus grows up, he will replace Odysseus. There'll be no place for Odysseus. So what Oranos does is he crams the children back into Earth. They'll never emerge from their mother. In the second story, Kronos sees that that doesn't work because he cooperated with his mother to destroy his father. So he crams the children into himself. And the image I had for this, I don't know whether it will help you, is um, a, a father who is a businessman. He was a vice president of a fairly large company, and what he does is he hires his son. And he keeps his son under him. And his son never emerges. His son will always be second man. But that doesn't work either, because the son does emerge. Okay, Zeus does destroy his father, Kronos. Now what's Zeus going to do? What Zeus does, and this is where I'll have a very different interpretation of Professor Esposito. What Zeus does is he realizes the problem right, is not the children, it's the mother. The way Professor Esposito reads the myth, he swallows the mother. He destroys the female. <coughs> Let me take the same myth and read it slightly differently. Remember that Zeus, in many, many ways, is power. And the mother that he swallows is quite literally wisdom. In some sense, the focus that I'm taking from the myth is the bringing together of power and of wisdom. Now, this is another vase you see at the MFA, or I hope have seen. But I wanted to show it to you here. This gives you one of the inches in the MFA uh, guide, by the way. Women in Greek painting are always strongly contrasted to men because they're, they're always painted in white as a convention. The Greek men are always painted in black. You should write that down. It's important for the answer. But look at these two figures. This is Zeus, clearly. This is Athena in full armor, emerging from his head. This, by the way, balanced you know, vertically is the sphinx. You know, the sphinx of the riddle is worth noting. But this is Ares, so it's entirely black. Look at the big emphasis on the Gorgon shield. Look at the enormous shield. And this, funnily enough, is, this woman is not identified. She's clearly a goddess because she's white. She may be Aphrodite. She may be the goddess of childbirth. It seems to me it doesn't, in a funny way, matter because the point is that she's female. And look at the figure of Athena. She's both. She's both. She's both the armor right, and the female. She's both of those two figures. See, and that's what I want to focus on. What I want to focus on is a way in which freedom and necessity can come together. A way in which I think in the play, a reading of the play, in which the male and the female can come together. Remember, in the very beginning of the Agamemnon, Clytemnestra is a woman that is minded like a man. It's a woman that takes over the position of a man and is disastrous. One way to read the play, I think, or to read the trilogy, is at the end there's another woman that's minded like a man. Yeah, but this is the positive version. This is Athena. The play will end, and that means geographically, right? not to Argos. You will travel from Argos, from the home of Agamemnon, to Delphi. Do you remember from Professor Scully's lectures? Remember, this is incredible mountainous wilderness of okay, the gods. It, almost like you'll say, okay, leaving the city to go out to the gods, the wilderness, but you'll end not back in Argos, but in Athens. In fact, you will end exactly where you, the audience, would have been sitting. It's an incredible move. The play actually centers, it's as if I were to write a play that begins, um, that begins in Mesopotamia, okay, with creation almost, okay, and ends in the Sison. At the end of the play, the courtroom is just on the other side of the Acropolis. Okay. Okay, the play comes around to you, the audience, to Athens, and I think to Athena. So let me go back, since what I'm trying to do here is really take the themes that were brought out first by Professor Spate about tragedy, 
And then, oh, by Professor Esposito, specifically about the Agamemnon. And those themes, as I've said, are the obvious ones. Right? On the human level, a conflict between male and female, a conflict between children and parents, between one generation and another. You can almost think of the trilogy, though, as being acted out, the same story being acted out on three, on three different levels. Right? On the next level up is a conflict between the family and the city. Agamemnon can see only his political obligations. Clytemnestra can see only the obligations of the family. When it comes to Orestes and Electra, Orestes, I think, as you read through, needs to reclaim his city. He needs to avenge the death of the king. Electra is very focused on her mother. She's very focused on the dark forces, on the passion. And that first scene in the libation bearers, in a lot of ways, I think, is bringing Orestes up to the pitch of fury that he needs. In some way, his choice, the choice to kill his own mother, to kill his mother, and for the sake of his city, in a lot of ways is Agamemnon's choice. It's the same pattern again. And finally, this is what we'll be talking about at the end of this section. The Furies in Apollo recapitulate precisely that distinction. Apollo says quite distinctly that he is for Agamemnon, he is for the king, he is for the political. The Furies are set on by the ghost of Clytemnestra. They are for the family, they are for blood ties. And if you look at you on your hand out here, you see where I am in the human story. This pattern that I have there, Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, Electra and Orestes, the Furies and Apollo, I meant to come out exactly like that. To me, that's the overall pattern of the play. The distilling out, in a way. Remember what Professor Esposito said? And there is, there's a growing clarity in the play. It starts very, very murky. I think one way to see that growing clarity is the issues somehow become more extreme. It's like they're distilled out by the time you get to the Furies and the Apollo. It's, it's simply female against male. It's simply city against family. That's the dialogue that's going to be the trial in the last play. Well, let me just recapitulate a tiny, tiny bit. One of the problems, and I never, it's partially a question of how, how to use words. A lot of what's going on in this play is about how to use words. This is a, it's a play about ideas, but it's not a play about symbols. And I'm not quite sure how to say that. Um, it's not a play about this person. It's a play about that person. And it's not a play really even about He's killing him. The play about when he turned around and he killed her. The play about human beings. And I, I, I believe this. I believe it very much. Okay. That every individual act you take is independent. And this is actually comes out of Montaigne that we read in the second, uh, second year. And yet there's a pattern here. And yet there's some overall kind of a meaning. Um, every individual act that any state in the United States makes, or any person, or any political institution, or the IRS, is independent. But there's a character to the country. There's some overall kind of sense. I think there may even be a pattern of history. There may be some meaning there. Okay. That doesn't mean that you're a symbol. That doesn't mean that when you decide to come to be you, you are being symbolic. right? of the United States moving to a more highly educated electorate. No, you're a person, you're not a symbol of anything. I think the same thing is true of Orestes. Is that in some sense, the meanings are in his life, okay, but that doesn't make him a symbol for the meaning. So let me start very quickly and go back over the story of Agamemnon and the story of Orestes. See if you can see all of these issues that I've been talking about in human terms. It starts with something sort of very simple, absolutely basic. Agamemnon comes back, and actually there's only one person from the Trojan War that he mentions. That's Odysseus. 
That has to make you wonder. Because right? one thing that Odysseus understood was you don't just walk in and say, hi dear, I'm home. That's the whole point of the epic. Odysseus had not murdered his daughter before he left for the war. So why does an Agamemnon not figure it out? The Agamemnon is not the smartest guy in Greek tragedy. He's definitely no, he's no Odysseus, he's no Einstein. But he's not that stupid. I mean, what is it that's going on in his head? Well, it's easy to see what's going on in his head anyway. Imagine the scene, he killed his daughter at that moment, the winds began to blow. Look at the image of the wind. The motion started. The men ran to the boats. They got on board. They went to Troy. And for 10 years, he hasn't slept in a bed. For 10 years, he's never slept knowing what was, not being afraid of what was going to happen. See, for 10 years, he's been engaged. He's been active. For 10 years, Clyde and Esther, and this is a pretty black joke, has been exactly like Penelope. He's been sitting in a house, brooding. And there's one picture that's been going over and over and over in her head. And that's the picture that the chorus gives you. The way her daughter, the child she was raised, was lifted up. She's very light. She's only 16 or so. Slender. Lifted up like a young goat. Her mouth gagged because if she screamed, it would be a bad one. And then her father took a knife and killed her. And that's the one thought that Clytemnestra has been having. And once you look at it that way, it doesn't seem to me very hard to see why Clytemnestra has her point of view, and Agamemnon is his point of view. But look at something else. When you get to the libation bearers, Electra has a kind of dark fury, which she says she inherits from her mother. It's really terrifying. What Orestes says is that Apollo is driving him on right, to take back his patrimony. Now, why would there be that difference? They're brother and sister. They're from the same parents. I would picture the scene this. If I was putting on the Oristaya, everybody, everybody in the production should take notice of that. When Orestes was sent away, he was a little baby. But when he comes back, he brings a piece of cloth that his sister has woven for him. Which means that, say, I'm making this up, the text doesn't tell you, say Orestes was four. Um, say then Electra must have been old enough to weave a piece of cloth, nine or ten or something. Eight or nine, I suppose that. So Agamemnon comes back 10 years later. Orestes has not been home. He's been away. He's 14. He will hear from somebody else what happened to his father. But Lecter is home. Lecter is 18 or 19. I was staging the play. As Agamemnon walked in, she was old enough to know her father when he left. Orestes isn't there, and Clytemnestra makes a point of it. But I think Lecter is. I think Electra may be a silent character who runs across, maybe, who tries to embrace her father that she's missed for 10 years and who gets brushed aside. And then, maybe, who hears the screams. In other words, Electra, as she says, was caged in. For all that time Orestes was gone, for all that time Orestes was in exile, he was a slave. He was a slave, I think, to her mother, I think she was also, just like Clytemnestra herself, a slave to her memories. She experienced it. She's been brooding over it, just as her mother has. Orestes hasn't. Orestes has been away. He's been with his friend Pylades. He's been in a masculine world of activity. And when he comes back, the choice he makes will be like his father. I think a lot of times it will be because his situation was. <laughs> Just before I move on to the last parallel, which is the parallel between the Furies, which is the parallel between the Furies, Clytemnestra and Electra, and Apollo. 
and Orestes and uh, Agamemnon. But let me just mention those two characters, the two funny sort of incidental characters. The first is the one I started with, Cassandra. And the second one is Pylades, Orestes' friend. It's really interesting. I think the, par the, the patterns in this play are incredible when you start seeing it. They're very similar in a lot of ways. They're both linked particularly to Apollo. For Pylades, one line, or his three lines, his one speech, is that when Orestes hesitates, how can he kill his mother? He says, remember Apollo. Remember the gods. Is of course Apollo that is driving Cassandra crazy. It's Apollo right, that shows Cassandra the meaning, the pattern, that gives her her gift, and makes it impossible for her to do anything with it. And also remember again the effect. Let me go back again. You remember what Professor Esposito was saying? There are only three speaking actors in a Greek tragedy. Now the whole audience knows that. Okay, this again is different. The conventions will make a difference. So when you have the chorus and two actors speaking, okay, say Electra and Orestes, or Agamemnon and Clytemnestra, there is a third character there that everybody in the audience is looking at. Everybody can see the Cassandra is there. She can't hide behind this area. Look at, look at the size. Everybody can see Pylades. They're waiting for him to say something. <laughs> you have an actor that you're giving this guy full wages, right? And he's got one speech. But the same kind of tension mounts up it with Pylades as it did with Cassandra. Okay. And notice again, they both come from outside the situation. They both have, in some sense, a perspective that's not wound into the net. But of course, and for all the similarities, there's an enormous difference. One way, right? one way the difference is that Cassandra is a woman, and Pylades is a man. And linked to that, and this is what I'm going to be talking about in the next section, Cassandra is a slave, and Pylades is free. talk a little bit about the Furies in Apollo before I go on to talk more about freedom and necessity. The, the plot of the last play, I'm sure you all have it perfectly down by down, it's perfectly simple. It's a continuation of the pattern. Agamemnon killed Iphigenia, Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon. Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon, so Orestes killed Clytemnestra. So Orestes is killed Clytemnestra. Somebody has to avenge that death. So the Furies will kill Orestes. It's all part of the pattern. You go round and round the bowl. But look what Aeschylus has done. In a way, what he's done is raise the ante. Because all of a sudden, it's not a human being that's taking vengeance. All of a sudden, the gods of vengeance themselves are taking vengeance. And what does that mean? What's really going on? What are the Furies? Well, one thing that the Furies and Apollo are going to be, as they conduct literally, literally a trial with Athena as judge over whether Orestes is innocent or not, they are a debate that's never been allowed to occur. You remember the way Professor Esposito was talking about Clytemnestra's language? It's language like a net. It traps you in. It's not language that talks. There's no dialogue there between who is right and who is wrong. You think then of Orestes. You begin a dialogue. Right? Orestes begins to wonder, can I kill my mother? Can all those political tiles really mean that I will look into my mother's eyes and put a sword through her? And Pylades stops that dialogue. That dialogue's never finished. So one way to look at the trial at the very end of the trilogy is that it's the debate that's needed to happen all the way through. But it could only happen when somehow it was abstracted 
from the from the purely human emotion, or what is abstracted from the human involvement. Yeah, but another way to look at it is in a way more emotional. Okay. And one way to see is this: Who are the Furies? Who are the Furies? Okay. Or I could ask myself. Well, you probably should. You should have asked yourself this: Agamemnon killed his daughter. Okay. Now nobody in the play denies that the father is bound by blood to his daughter. In fact, rather ironically, if Apollo is right and the mother isn't, okay, then Agamemnon was doubly guilty okay, because he was the only one that was bound in blood to his own child. So why didn't the Furies avenge her? Why didn't the Furies avenge her? So I think in a sense they did, and in this sense, now think all the way back to Professor Scully's lecture on the Greek gods. Remember when he was talking about Athena? Okay, Athena, in a sense, is that moment when you get it. You've been working over something, you've been trying to figure it out, and you get it. That's Athena. The Greek gods work from inside. Okay. Aphrodite isn't the moment. Aphrodite doesn't come to you and wave a magic wand over your head, and you feel I don't know, so if you felt it, you'd understand what I mean, that there is just one person that is incredibly attractive. Why that person? Why not another person? Who knows? But you just feel it. And every time you see that person, that is Aphrodite. That is Aphrodite. So what are the Furies? The Furies, the Furies are feeling any human being you can get. You can get it if you have a younger brother or a younger sister. You have to think of them now, or a niece or a nephew. It's always about a child, somebody who's helpless. Okay, you know what happens. They're, they're alone. The stranger picks them up. He takes them somewhere. Okay, somewhere. Somewhere where if the child cries, nobody's going to hear. The child screams, nobody's going to hear. You know the kind of things that happen. And children get tortured, get raped, get murdered. It's in the papers all the time. If you want to know what the Furies are, all you have to do is imagine that. And I think in a way, if you're a human being and you don't get some feeling in your gut, some sense just, I don't know, just a feeling, then, then I just don't, I don't wonder if, I don't know, you think you can, do you? And to me, that is what the Furies are. The Furies are that feeling. Well, but that's what Clytemnestra says at the end of the Agamemnon. You claim the work is mine, call me Agamemnon's wife. You are so wrong. Fleshed in the wife of this dead man, the spirit lives within me. Our savage, ancient spirit of revenge. In return for Atreus's brutal feast, he kills his perfect son. For every murdered child, a crowning sacrifice. Clytemnestra says that when Agamemnon's blood sprayed over her and wet her, she rejoiced as the earth does in spring when the rain falls on it. She is the What about Apollo then? I say, what's going on in human terms in the last play? Orestes has taken a sword and put it into his mother's heart. How is he going to live with that? How can he stop that image going around and around and around the same way Clytemnestra saw her daughter killed? That's the Furies hold over him. That's the way they bind him in. So, but then what about Apollo? Well, Apollo in one way is obviously the opposite of the Furies. Okay, the, Apollo is young, the Furies are old. Apollo is bright, the Furies are dark. <laughs> Apollo is male, he stands for the city, he stands for understanding and reason and music and medicine and order. The Furies are the opposite of all of those. So what's Apollo to Orestes? To me, it's just the other feeling. Okay. If I imagine what it is to be Orestes, my response is, he had no choice. He had no choice because he did it. 
He did. He killed his mother. But he had no choice. There's something in me that refuses to believe the necessity. There's something in me that says he had a reason. There's a reason to do it. You've got to give people some freedom. To me, that's what Apollo is. So let me move into now the sort of second part about necessity and freedom. You notice in a way that East Coast uses the trilogy in a really sort of horrible manner. Just like the net. Every time you think you're free, you are more engaged. The more you struggle, the more you act. The worse the, worse the net finds you in. At the very end of the Agamemnon, you remember, Phytonestra says, it's over. We will set the house in order once for all. The very next scene, Orestes says, Hermes, Lord of the dead, look down and guard the Father's power. Remember what Professor Esposito was saying? The past is not over. The past will come back, and it will get you. If the same thing happens as Orestes goes in to murder Clytemnestra and Aegisthus. The chorus sing. Lift the cry of triumph, O oh, the master's house winds free of grief, free of the ones who bled its wealth, the couple stained with murder, free of fate's rough path, free, finally, free. And that is the point where Orestes sees the furies. So that's why I call this first part justice, remembering and forgetting. That sense of vengeance. Okay. Now, I don't think it makes any sense at all to say that it's good or it's bad. It is. If you imagine something horrible, like I was speaking, you can't just make it go away. You can't just be over. Somebody has to pay. Now, I don't know whether this is a good example or not, but I'll use it. Um, remember, Professor Esposito was talking about the Holocaust and the need to remember. And the presence of somebody like Professor Wiesel here on campus. And to me, that's deeply right. That is deeply right. Six billion people cannot get processed like pieces of meat, killed scientifically. And you just say, well, that was the past. It's over. On the other hand, I mean, almost all the people who are living in Germany now weren't even alive then. So I can see, and I, in a funny way I don't want to see, but I can see, I guess, how you would feel to say, I was born into, I didn't do it. I didn't do, yes, it was horrible, but I didn't do it. Okay, it was my parents and my grandparents, but I didn't do it. I have to be free. See, that's what I mean about this idea of remembering and forgetting. It's not right to forget. It's not right to simply have it all over. And that's the bad side of what Apollo stands for. Apollo stands for pardon. All the way through, look for the images okay, of purgation, okay, of washing clean. Ixion is pardoned of his murder. It's over. You can be purified. Those of you, okay, those of you, I'm sure there are a lot of you who've read Macbeth. Okay, if you remember any scene in Macbeth, you remember the scene of her washing her hands clean of the blood. There's a point, there's a point where you have to be clean. And she can't. And she can't. You can't wash the blood off. On some level, you need to wash the blood off. You need the purification. But you can't make it like it didn't happen. What I'm suggesting is what that purification is, a lot of ways is forgetting. What does Orestes need to do? 
needs to get out of the loop that destroyed his mother. He has to stop having that steam run over and over and over in his head. But what the Furies say is that can't happen. Can a son spill his mother's blood on the ground and then settle into his father's hall in Argos? This is where, to me, the theme of remembering and forgetting becomes the theme of freedom right, and necessity. The past is binding you in, but you have to get to the future. You can't stop remembering, but on the other hand, you need to forget. So that same theme, the theme of can you actually let a murderer off? and just let it be as if it didn't happen. It comes up again with the idea of the family and the city. And the theme of the family and the city is so clear. Yeah, yeah, I don't have to go through it. But let me take a slightly different angle on it, and one that you might not have noticed. Now, the usual way to see it, that I think is perfectly right, is to say that Clytemnestra sees only the claims of the family. And Agamemnon sees only his duty as king. And that certainly is true in the last play. I mean, when the Furies are asked, why did you not avenge the death of Agamemnon, right, they say, Clytemnestra wasn't related to him. They're only blood ties. He wasn't any of her own. And on the other hand, I guess in my view, Apollo is just as extreme as the Furies are. Why can't a son kill his mother? The son's not related to his mother. There's no tie there. Those are the two extreme sides. But look at something slightly funny. Is it's not entirely family versus city. So when Agamemnon goes to war, he goes to war for his brother's wife. And what Paris has done is to violate the ties that we create to bind human beings together. Those ties for the Greeks were primarily xenia, primarily guest friendship. See, but there was another tie that we create that binds people together that was as true for the Greeks as it is for us. And that's marriage. And marriage is not any place in nature. It's a tie that human beings make up to tie people together. And notice that actually in the end, Apollo becomes the champion of marriage. He says, you would disgrace, obliterate the bonds of Zeus and Hera, queen of brides. And the queen of love, you throw to the winds at a word. Disgrace love, the source of mankind's nearest, dearest ties. Marriage of man and wife is fate itself stronger than oaths, and justice guards its life. You listen to Apollo. Marriage of man and wife is fate itself, stronger than oaths, and justice guards its life. No, it's not. No, it's not. Marriage of man and wife is not fate. Marriage of man and wife is something you choose. And that's why, to me, it's related to the themes of what you're free about and what's necessity. Some of you will choose to get married. Some of you will choose not to get married. And when you choose to get married, you may choose well, or you may choose badly. And, and obviously in our society, as opposed to the Greeks, mm -hmm. if you choose wrong, you can undo the decision. Okay. That's not going to be completely going back as if you had never been married at all. Okay. But once you've been somebody's husband or wife, it's possible to become somebody else's husband or wife. That's not true of your parents. If you never, ever, from this moment, see your parents again, if you never speak to them, if you decide that you will have nothing to do with them, you will still be their child. There's nothing you can do about that. And the same thing will be true when you have children. Okay? You may be able to decide when or if you have a child. 
You won't decide who that God will be. The ties of blood, the ties of the Furies, proclaim. The ties, actually, as we would say, of DNA. The genetic ties are not ones you choose. Okay, they're ones that bind you in, that make you what you are. They're, not one, they're ones that determine you, okay, as opposed to ones that you determine. See, in that sense, it makes perfect sense to me that Apollo becomes the great champion of Mary. That brings me to the last level. Remember, one of the reasons why I want to show you this vase was to remind you of the difference, again, that Professor Spate was talking about in his lecture, about the old gods, the primeval gods, the dark gods, Okay, the gods like Kronos devouring his child. And the Olympian deities okay, were primarily represented by Apollo. Apollo is a god of the sun, of order, okay, of light. Now if you look on your handout, you see here under old gods and new. What I have is not, again, the theories of Apollo. It is something different. The Fates and Zeus. Why did I put them in? If you think that those of you who, this is a very useful distinction for those of you who, who know it. Okay. When we get into the second semester and we start doing Chinese thought, okay, one of the basic patterns, probably the basic pattern of Chinese thought, would be the yin and the yang. Okay. The yin is the dark, the yang is the light. Okay. The yin is the female, and the yang is the male. The yin is the family, and the yang is the city. The yin is the private, and the yang is the public. The yin okay, is dark and earth and blood, okay, and the yang is light and the skies and the heavens. If you look at the images that go all the way through the Oristaya, you'll see them. A okay, fire as opposed to darkness. Crimson robes on the ground, right? Blood going into the earth, birds flying into the sky. And they'll all organize finally around Apollo, who is everything young, and the Furies were everything in. Now, in that sense, think who the mother of the Furies are. The mother of the Furies is night, and the ultimate darkness. And the sisters of the Furies, they continually refer to are the fates. Now the Greek word fate has no idea of this kind of mechanical clockwork thing that, uh, that we tend to associate with it. In fact, the word is, the fate is a Latin word. The word in Greek is moira, moira. And what it means is a portion, okay? It's what you get, it's what you're born with. It's your portion, it's your portion in life. The word Moira, fate, in Greek can have another meaning too. That is exactly the same association we make when we talk about something being fatal. There is one thing that is everybody's portion, and that's death. There is one thing that is fated for all human beings, and that is death. Whenever it happens, however it happens, wherever it happens, it will happen. Those are the powers that are linked to the Furies. Those are the dark powers. And obviously, in a sense, it's the ultimate necessity. And what then about Zeus? <coughs> Apollo, when he sees the Furies, has an ultimate revulsion towards them. And it's worthwhile noticing that Athena's reaction, by the way, is not precisely the same. But he is everything they are not, and they are everything he despises. So see what he says. He says, they disgust me, these gray ancient children, born of destruction only, the dark pit. They range the bowels of earth, the world of death, loathed by men and the gods who hold Olympus. What Apollo says, and I want you to remember the role of words all the way through. I'm going to come back to that. He says that Orestes can be freed by words. 
but there'll be a court, and a court will operate with words. With judges of your case, with a magic spell, with words, we will devise the master stroke that sets you free from torment once for all. But the fury says, young god, you have ridden down the powers proud with age. You worship the suppliant, the godless man who tears his parents' heart, stains on the hearth. The prophet stains the vault. He cries it on, dries on the crime himself. Breaking the god's first law, he rates men first destroys the old dominions of the fates. He wounds me too, yet him he'll never free, plunging under the earth, no freedom there. The question is, can Orestes be freed? Apollo says, yes, by words. If the Furies say no, fate will bind him in. Okay, but look at the words, and look at the word translated here, prophet. And whose words are Apollo's? Apollo's words are Zeus's. His words come from Zeus. Okay, if the fates are ultimately the force that lie behind the Furies, okay, the ultimate source of the old gods, then Zeus is the force that lies, okay, that lies behind Apollo, the ultimate source of the new. Well, but that's why I put this vase back up. That's how we're heading towards our resolution. Yeah, but it'll be a while yet. If Zeus is not the father only of Apollo. Zeus is also the father of Athena. And I think that's where the reconciliation is going to come in. Before I get actually to the third part, I want to notice one sort of Peculiarity. So fate, as I said, means death. The word Moira means death. Apollo, remember, is a god of medicine, among other things. And there's a curious scene which you probably wouldn't have noticed in the first, in the first play in the Agamemnon, where well, the chorus sings about Asclepius. Asclepius writes the god of medicine. Okay. And Asclepius once, he was such a great doctor that he could bring men back from death. Asclepius is the son of Apollo. The same thing happens again in the story of Admetus. Apollo wants to free his friend Admetus from death. So what he does is he makes the fates Drunk. And the Furies refer to this. You triumphed in the house of fairies, luring the fates to set men free from death. You brought them down. The oldest realms of order seduced the ancient goddesses with wine. The ultimate necessity, the ultimate fate, is that when a man's blood sinks into the earth, it will never come back again. There's no coming back from death. Apollo has opposed this. And Apollo is the god of freedom. There's a curious scene, though, where the Furies challenge Apollo in the trial. And they say, you say Zeus told him right, to avenge his father, but Zeus himself overthrew his father. How can that be? And Apollo says, Zeus can break chains. We've cures for that. Countless ingenious ways to set us free. Apollo is a god of freedom. But once the dust drinks down a man's blood, he's gone once for all. No rising back. No spell sung over the grave can sing him back. Not even father can. It's the one concession Apollo makes. When a man is dead, Dead. And there's a little bit in the first chorus that I didn't mention. That when Asclepius brought a man back from the dead, when he defied the fates, it was Zeus that struck him down. Remember 
the very first word of the play is the gods. And at that point, the watchman is looking up towards the light, or hoping for the light, looking up, hoping for the light. The first word of the second play is Hermes, the god of the underworld. Remember what Professor Esposito said? Okay, they are bookends. It begins with the gods. This is a god-saturated play, he said. It begins with the gods, and it ends with the gods. But the last line, and I think you'll see why I've been building up to this. The last line of the play is Zeus and the fates have come together. There is some place where Zeus, unlike Apollo, okay, but I think, like his daughter Athena, he recognizes the absolute necessity of fate. So let me talk now about how, how that can be. It's simply a logical impossibility, and Apollo is a god of logic, so this will be. How can you have fate and freedom? How can you have a pattern and still have a choice? Well, in a sense, obviously, the major of the way you read this trilogy is going to depend on how you see the trial. Aeschylus has set the two sides up for, for, for debate. There's the Furies and there's Apollo. The Furies say there is no freedom. There's no escape from the past. Apollo says there's pardon, there's forgetting, there's moving to the future. So Apollo wins. Apollo wins, quite simply. It's true, it's true the human beings tie. On the human level, it seems, the balance is equally made. But Athena breaks the tie. The vote is for freedom. And that's the end of the play. Except not quite, except not quite. What I want to do is start with the idea of the humanities. This is the last third of the play. And what's very strange is the story that's about Orestes. Right? The Oristia doesn't end with Orestes. Orestes leaves, he's been set free, and he goes back significantly to his city. And then Athena, but it's the second, the last third of the play, trying to convince the Furies that they haven't been defeated. Freedom has won, and Athena now is trying to make the forces of necessity a part of her city. Let me go all the way back. Okay, at this point, I think you can all visualize what that red carpet of blood looked like. You can all visualize Agamemnon choosing to walk over that carpet of blood. And you can see, and this is why I wanted to make sure I brought this slide, how vivid that would look. The play ends, there's a procession, a torchlight procession. Now remember, this is not actually the theater of Dionysus, but we'll pretend it is. It's the play is now set in Athens where you are. And Aeschylus has gone out of his way, actually, to make a number of topical references, so you have a sense of real immediacy. There's a procession when the Furies agree to become part of Athens, and their name is changed from Furies to Eumenides, the well-minded ones. I think, and you'll have to discuss this, they have the same job they always had. They are gods of blood, of fertility, and of vengeance. Remember, Athena says there is a place where terror is good. There's a need for the claims of vengeance, okay, but within the city, regulated somehow by law. But before the procession takes place, the symbol that the Furies become part of the city is they put on red robes, brilliant crimson red robes. In the actual procession in Athens, the people who would have worn the red robes are the people called the Metoikoi, M-E-T-O-I-K-O-I. -O -I -O -I. The Metoikoi 
are the people who chose to come to Athens. They aren't citizens, they just chose to come and live there. And what you see is a symbol of the Furies' choice to join Athens. And you just have to picture this. In a brilliant red procession, they parade out into the ground of Athens, like the red carpet, like the blood soaking into the earth, right, coming full circle around. Now, obviously, in my reading, bringing the forces of necessity and passion into the city, resolving the plague, resolving the crisis that began with the first red carpet. Now, why would you want to do that? Or, maybe I should say, why, um, why be in Athens at all? Well, first of all, what's important to me, is Athena. Athena is male and female. But more importantly, see, this is a long, long time ago, ages ago. I think you can remember Professor Scully's lecture. Remember the big use of the Zeus, the statue of Zeus? Remember this the whole? And the whole point of this was that this hand is really ordered. There's something beautifully ordered about that motion. But this hand okay, is power. Now, Athena tells the Furies that she's the only person who knows where Zeus's thunderbolts are kept. Do you remember the statue that he showed you of Apollo? Okay. And the extraordinary thing about that was the gesture was this. It was the order, but not the power. The one half of Zeus. The Athena, this is obviously my argument, is both halves. Let me remind you of something. Okay, this, and this is, this is something I shouldn't have, something that should be immediate to you. It's what the words pathe mathos mean. Pathe mathos means wisdom in suffering. Mathos is like mathematics. Pathe is the same word I used when I was talking about Odysseus. The fact that Odysseus endures. Odysseus is a hero that experiences. And the word pathos right, is the same as our word pathos. But also passive, right? passion, okay. but also the root of sympathy, okay, to suffer together, empathy, okay, to feel with someone else. That the theme okay, that occurs in the verse, okay, right after Aeschylus describes the scene, okay, right after he describes the pattern of the generation of the gods. He, he ends with the idea that in experience, in suffering, there's some kind of wisdom. So what does that have to do with this? One reason why Aeschylus would have wanted to end the play in Athens is what Athens meant for Aeschylus was freedom. And this, the legend is that on Aeschylus's grave, what was inscribed was not that he was the, probably the greatest tragedian that has ever lived, but that he fought as an ordinary soldier at the Battle of Salamis. He fought for Athens' freedom. The Greeks, this is Marathon right before, were outnumbered 10 to 1. The Persians, and Professor Scully will be talking about this on Tuesday, the Persians were fighting for their king. They were fighting as slaves. The Greeks went on and cried freedom and won. Now what is that freedom? Both the Furies and Athena say, neither anarchy nor tyranny. Not no law and not absolute law. Something in between. That, I think, is why the play has to take place in Athens. Now, why do the Furies have to come in? Remember the Professor Spade's lecture. Okay, the whole opposition I've been talking about, the whole opposition of the 